All right. I think we will get started. Uh, I see people are joining. Um, hopefully by the time the intro is done, um, we will have settled with the numbers. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back to the academic year, the beginning of the academic year. It's good to see you all back. I hope you had a good break with your families and are ready for the year ahead. So um, this is um, our second cycle of uh, the Fellows uh, Gecko program, which was specifically designed uh, for the Fellows so that uh, we can allow for peer group teaching uh, and to focus in on, on topics which we found we were not able to do uh, on the Wednesday Gecko platform. So this is why this was created. And I'm very pleased and uh, proud of the fact that uh, the Fellows in the last two years have been very, very committed to this program, have really put on excellent uh, presentations. And uh, at the feedback at the end of the year, the feedback was overall good. And uh, the feeling was that we should carry on. So we're starting a new cycle. So we're going back to the beginning. Um, there will be a review of some of the topics we've done to try and improve um, the topics that are being offered. But really, we're trying to cover the core curriculum uh, in gastroenterology. So welcome to all of you. Some of you may be new and may not be familiar with the platform and what its objectives are. So briefly, that's what I've explained. This project, uh, ECHO, we are very grateful because uh, the University of New Mexico, um, together with the Gastro Foundation, has allowed us uh, to use this platform to be able to do this teaching. Uh, and as I say, which is specifically for the fellows. And I think it's such a privilege uh, and an honor to be able to do this. So welcome. We meet every fortnight on a Monday at 6 p.m. The presentations are done by the fellow, the facilitation by either one of the heads of uh, units at the different academic centers or a consultant uh, whose area of interest and expertise uh, the topic is in. And so please feel free to post questions uh, in the chat box or even better at the end of the presentations, you're welcome to put your hand up, uh, unmute and ask the question. So the topic for today is uh, anatomy and physiology of the foregut. The first time around, we did anatomy and physiology of the entire gut, which was, as you can imagine, a very, very loaded uh, uh, topic. And so this time I thought that as we do sections, so now we're going to start with the foregut, we will go on to the small bowel, the midgut, and then later on to the large bowel. I thought it makes sense to do the physiology and anatomy of each section as we do the pathology uh, of each section. So it's still a busy topic um, because, you know, there's so much with anatomy and physiology. Quite dry, I'm afraid, but it's a good uh, foundation. And I think it's important to know this. And um, it might be even difficult to read it on your own. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity to try and get a sense of just the functioning and the anatomy uh, of the gut uh, as a basis on which other topics um, will unfold. So uh, Dominic uh, is a fellow in our own center here in Cape Town. And I think he was worried about how dry the topic is. So I reassured him that uh, that's just how the cookie crumbles. You can't really make anatomy and physiology sexy, but it is important uh, to know. So Dominic, if you're ready, please um, share your slides. Let's go through the slides and then uh, hopefully we'll have questions for you uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mashiko, for that kind introduction. Um, are my slides visible to the audience? Yes. Um, you can see my slides? Yes, Dominic. Okay, so I just, uh, thank you. So we'll go through the anatomy and the physiology of the foregut. I'll start with a general introduction on... Second. Just, just a minute. So I'll just quickly go through the overall uh, functions of the gastrointestinal system and just give a general overview on how the anatomy and physiology of the GI system will be tackled in this particular session and in subsequent sessions. So as an introduction, the primary function of the alimentary tract 
as you all know, is to provide nutrients to all the systems in the human body. And the gastrointestinal system is able to break down food to provide the body with a continuous supply of water, electrolytes, and nutrients. And it's able to do this by performing the following pro processes. So there's ingestion, mastication, propulsion, secretion, digestion, absorption, and subsequently elimination. So the general principles, we're going to uh, touch on the components of the gastrointestinal tract, the structure, and the regulation of the GIT tract. The components of the GIT tract, we have the accessory organs, we have the upper GIT tract and the lower GIT tract. So the accessory organs we're going to ta uh, tackle today are the teeth, the tongue, the, salivator, uh, the salivary glands, the liver, the gall, blood, and pancreas will be tackled on another day. So basically the components, uh, the accessory components, we have the oral cavity where we find the teeth and the tongue. The core function is mechanical processing, moistening and also mixing of uh, the food with uh, salivary secretions. And uh, we have the salivary glands whose core function is the lubrication of fluid containing enzymes that breaks down uh, the food in uh, carbohydrates basically. Then we have the liver and the gallbladder whose core function is the secretion of bile duct which has a important role in the lipid digestion and the storage of nutrients by the liver and many other vital functions and the gallbladder is a store and a, a store of bile and has a role in the concentration of bile so looking at the structure of the digestive tract we have uh, the lumen and in the lumen we have the mucosa and the muscularis propria the mucosa is further subdivided into the epithelium, the basement membrane, the muscularis, and the submucosa. Then you have the muscularis propria, where you have the circular muscle layer, the myenteric plexus, and the longitudinal muscle layer. Then you also have the mesothelium, also known as the serosa. So looking at the mucosa, it's variable throughout the entire extent of the gastrointestinal tract in structure, and also variability in function. And it's uh, designed that way so that it's able to perform a diverse and specialized tasks. So the epithelium is the innermost layer and includes all the cells which are dedicated to secretion, absorption, and production of hormones. The lamina propria is actually formed of loose connective tissue and through which you have the blood vessels and the lymphatics which supply the epithelium coursing through it. And it also has a role for the immune cells and nerve fibers. We have the muscularis mucosa, which is a thin layer of smooth muscle, which is beneath the lamina propria, and this permits the mucosa to fold and also to move. So this is just basically a cross-section of the histological features of the gastrointestinal tract at different points from the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and the large intestine, so that we're able to really appreciate how it appears histologically and the difference. So looking at the regulation of the GIT processes, we have secretion, digestion, absorption, and motility, and they're integrated in such a manner as to ensure that there's efficient assimilation of nutrients. And the three main modalities operating uh, to achieve this uh, operate through a complementary fashion, and we have endocrine functions, paracrine, and also the nervous system coming in. So endocrine, during a meal event, it triggers the hormones to be released. And these hormones are messengers which travel through the bloodstream to ensure this, uh, this influence of the activity of uh, distant segments and also uh, to drain various organs. So we have various hormones like gastrin, which is produced in the antrum and the duodenum. And it has a role in acid secretion, mucosal growth, and also antral motility. We have cholecystokinin, which is produced uh, in the small bowel and has a role in pancreatic enzyme and bile secretion and the relaxation of the sphincter of OD and also decreasing gastric emptying. Secretin is also produced by the duodenum and um, does a role in the pan pancreatic and bile bicarbonate secretion and also reduces acid secretion. So paracrine functions, uh, basically we have this uh, chemical mediators or messengers, which actually regulate the function of uh, the cells within the GIT tract within a short distance from the site where they are actually secreted. This is actually different from the endocrine function where you're having 
the effects of these second messengers uh, and mediators happening uh, at a distant site from where they are produced. So an example is somatostatin that's produced by the D cells in the stomach and they reduce gastrin and uh, gastric uh, and also have a role in gastric acid release. Also histamine, which potentiates the parietal cells. So within the nervous system, you have neural control either through the enteric nervous system and uh, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. The enteric nervous system, you have the neurons with their cell bodies contained within the gut wall. So basically they're intrinsic to the GIT, whereas in the intrinsic, extrinsic nervous system, the cell bodies are located outside the gastrointestinal tract wall and allow for bidirectional communication between the brain and the gut. And this forms the brain-gut axis. So the nervous regulation of the digestive system, you have the local enteric nervous system, and the types of neurons are sensory motor and you have interneuron uh, connections. And these uh, play a role in the coordination of peristalsis and also regulates local reflexes. So as the stomach empties into the small intestine, you have these local reflexes that regulates the rate of emptying. And in general, you have coordination with the central nervous system, which may initiate reflexes uh, because of uh, the smell of food, the taste of food, or even just visually seeing the food uh, can trigger uh, certain reflexes. And it's primarily par parasympathetic. The sympathetic in input normally inhibits the muscle contraction, secretion, and decrease uh, of blood flow to the digestive tract. So let's let's quickly go through the foregut. So the foregut is defined as a section of the gut from the mouth to the first part of the duodenum. So we are going to touch on the oral cavity, specifically the salivary glands, the esophagus, and the stomach. So the oral cavity, uh, we have uh, the salivary glands, which I mentioned earlier, are accessory gland. I mean, accessory organs of the digestion, and their core function is to produce saliva. We have three sets of saliva salivary glands. We have the parotid, which contributes about 20% uh, of the amount of saliva we produce. Then we have the submandibular, which produces about 65 to 70%. And uh, the sublingual, which produces about 5%. So the secretion of saliva is mediated through the parasympathetic uh, stimulation. And we produce about 500 ml to 1.5 liters within a duration of 24 hours. And the composition of this saliva is between 16, I'm sorry, 97 to 99.5% water. And it's hypoosmotic with a pH of between 6.5 to 7. And the solids which are contained are bicarbonate, sodium chloride, and potassium. Also, the digestive enzymes which are uh, found within the saliva, such as amylase and lipase. And also, we have proteins such as mucin, IgA, and lysozymes and defensins. Also, we get some waste products such as urea and uric acid in the saliva. So the core functions of saliva is to initiate the digestion of starch and lipids. It also has a role in protection of the oral cavity through IgA and also lysozyme. And the function, and this lysozyme functions also as a cytokine uh, for lymphocytes in the mouth. It also provides lubrication for the food such that you're able to uh, form a bolus in the mouth. It also facilitates taste. It also helps in speaking, swallowing, and also chewing. And it also acts as a buffer for the gastric re reflux it into the esophagus. So when food is ingested, you have chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors in the mouth, which send signals to the salivate, salivatory nuclei in the brainstem, uh, predominantly in the pons and the medulla. And as a result, you have this parasympathetic nervous system activity, which increases. So you have sensory motor uh, fibers within the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, which dramatically increase the output of watery saliva. So the chemoreceptors are activated, and uh, these ones are triggered mostly by acidic foods and liquid foods, such as uh, pickles, vinegar, and uh, uh, this, that, and madume. Then uh, you have the mechanoreceptors, which are activated by almost any type of mechanical stimulus in the mouth, uh, like chewing. So looking at the physiology of swallowing, swallowing consists of three phases. So we have the oral uh, preparatory phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal phase. 
and they usually performed effortlessly up to 600 times in a day. So once swallowing has been initiated, it takes less than one second for a bolus to reach the esophagus, then additional 10 to 15 seconds to complete the swallowing, and the process involves more than 30 muscles which are working in synchrony. So the swallowing centers within the brainstem are interdependent and receive bilateral, uh, though asymmetric projections from the motor and the premotor context. This, this is especially important in the setting of a uh, uh, some patients uh, might uh, have recovery of their swallowing response after a stroke uh, being being different, depending on which uh, which side of the of the, of the brain where you're having the the stroke. So, looking at the oral preparatory phase, the bolus is processed by mastication to an appropriate size, shape, and consistency that will allow it to pass through the pharynx into the esophagus. And this phase is largely voluntary. And the tongue is a critical part of this phase, both for the controlling uh, the food so that the, there's proper chewing and it can occur, um, uh, so that you actually have a proper chewing uh, to happen. And uh, also it helps direct the bolus into its proper position for swallowing. So after chewing this, uh, the bolus is moved to the back of the tongue. And the anterior portion of the tongue will lift up to uh, the hard palate and it retracts posteriorly, forcing the bolus into the upper pharynx. So you have the elevation of the posterior portion of the tongue by the mylohyoid muscles and it elevates the soft palate, thereby sealing the nasopharynx, preventing nasal regurgitation. So for this uh, phase, uh, it's normally under voluntary control and it involves the cranial nerves uh, five, which is the trigeminal, the facial, and also glossopharyngeal. So looking at the pharyngeal phase, the bolus is now advanced through the pharynx into the esophagus by the pharyngeal peristalsis. And this occurs by approximation of the soft palate to the posterior nasopharyngeal wall. This seals off the nasopharyngeal in inlet, and it does so by contraction of the superior constrictor muscles. So simultaneously, the larynx and the hyoid are pulled up and forward, allowing the bolus to pass over the larynx uh, without the risk of aspiration of, and uh, this causes relaxation of the cricopharyngeal muscle, which makes up uh, much of the upper esophageal sphincter. So for the pharyngeal phase, unlike the oral phase, it's controlled reflex, reflexively, and it's referred to as the swelling response. And the cranial nerves which are involved are the cranial nerve number five, the glossopharyngeal, that's number nine, and the vagus and the hypoglossal nerves. And during swallowing, this phase of uh, respiration is inhibited centrally. So the esophageal phase, you have the peristatic contractions in the body of the esophagus, which is combined by simultaneous relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which now propels the bolus into the stomach. So I'll just quickly just uh, display an image of the what you normally see during gastroscopy. Uh, during intubation, so you can appreciate the vocal cords and the epiglottis here. And you can see the this uh, vestibular fold, and you can see this uh, epiglottic fold and this piriform sinus. So normally during intubation, we aim to actually go below here uh, into the esophagus. So also the, there's various spectrum of abnormalities which you can appreciate at this point in time. In patients, uh, certain patients, you can find them having this inclusion cyst, like as demonstrated here. In patients with Osler Weber Rendau syndrome, you can find multiple telagic tasias around this area, you can appreciate. Also, those who uh, received radiotherapy, you can have radiotherapy damage as demonstrated. In those with obstructive jaundice, you can appreciate the yellow discoloration. And in uh, patients who are having um, like esophageal malignancies with the distant metastasis, you can appreciate this, uh, the right vocal cord paralysis. And also you can see destruction of the larynx from laryngeal carcinoma. And in those patients who are having a hypopharyngeal cancer, you can see uh, this, this tumor here. And in those with superior vena cava syndrome, you can appreciate the, these varices around. So let's go to the esophagus. So this is a uh, 18 to 26 centimeter long polomuscular tube. 
with an inner lining of stratified squamous epithelium. It's normally collapsed in between swallows. And during the swallowing, the lumen distends up to two centimeters in the anterior posterior uh, plane and three centimeters laterally to accommodate a swallowed bolus. And structurally, it's composed of four layers. You have the innermost mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis propria, and an outermost adventitia. But uh, the esophagus does not have a serosa. So the muscularis propria is responsible for the organ's motor function. In the musculature for the esophagus, you have the upper, uh, which is exclusively skeletal muscle, accounting for 5 to 33%. The distal 50% uh, is composed of smooth muscle, and in between, it's a mixture of both smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. So the upper esophageal sphincter, uh, it's uh, formed by the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, constrictor, which merges with the cricopharyngeus, which is a skeletal muscle and it's contracted at rest, and it creates a high-pressure zone that pre prevents inspired air from entering the esophagus. And below the upper esophageal sphincter, you have the esophageal wall, which is composed of an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer of muscle. The esophageal body lies within the posterior mediastinum behind the trachea and the left main bronchus, and it uh, swings leftward to pass behind the heart in front of the aorta. And at the level of the uh, T10 vertebra, the esophageal body leaves the thorax through a hiatus, which is located within the right cruise of the diaphragm. The lower esophageal sphincter is uh, two to four centimeters in length, and it has a symmetric thickening of the circular smooth muscle, where the esophageal body ends with a diaphragmatic uh, hiatus. Then we have the phrenoesophageal ligament, which is uh, responsible for fixation. And it enables diaphragmatic contractions to assist the lower esophageal sphincter in maintaining a high pressure zone during exercise. This prevents uh, any uh, reflux. So let's go through the esophageal mucosa. So endoscopically, uh, it's seen as being smooth and pink. At the esophagogastric junction, it's normally an irregular white Z line, which demarcates the inter interface between the lighter esophageal and the red gastric mucosa. Histologically, it's non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and it consists of three functionally distinct layers. You have the stratum corneum, which acts as a permeability barrier between luminal content. The stratum spongiosum, which contains metabolically active cells with a spiny shape. You have the stratum germinativum, which contains cuboidal cells, 10 to 15% of the epithelial epithelium thickness and has a unique capability of replication. You also have basal cell hyperplasia. Uh, you can have basal cell hyperplasia, which is defined as uh, basal cells which are more than 15% of the epithelial thickness, which normally indicates that you're having an increased rate of tissue repair. This is often a feature which is noted in patients with their gastroesophageal reflux disease. We also have a small number of other cell types, uh, such as agrophilic neuroendocrine cells, melanocytes, lymphocytes, and macrophages and eosinophils. And rarely do we ever find any neutrophils. And when they are present, it normally uh, depicts that the, the epithelium is not healthy. So looking at the esophageal submucosa, it comprises of a dense network of connective tissue within which uh, blood vessels, lymphatic channels, neurons of the mesonas, plexus, and esophageal glands are contained. And these glands vary as to the number and distribution along the esophagus and consists of cuboidal cells organizing, organized as arsenic, and they produce and secrete lubricant, mucus, and factors such as bicarbonate and epidermal growth factor that are important for epithelial defense and repair. And the secretions from these glands pass into the tortuous collecting ducts that deliver them to the esophageal lumen. So uh, let me quickly go through the arterial supply. So the arterial and the venous blood supply to the esophagus is segmental. So there you have it. The upper esophagus, you have branches of the superior and inferior thyroid arteries. The mid esophagus, you have branches from the bronchial and the right intercostal arteries, and also uh, you have branches from the descending aorta. The distal esophagus, you have branches of the left gastric, the inferior 
phrenic and also splenic arteries. And all these vessels are anastomosed to create a dense network within the submucosa. And this probably explains for the fact of how rare it is to encounter esophageal uh, infarction. The venous circulation um, is also uh, segmental. You're having um, venous drainage of the upper esophagus through the superior vena cava, the mid esophagus through the azygous vein, the distal esophagus through the portal vein by means of the left and uh, the short gastric veins. Then you have this uh, submucosal venous anastomotic network of the distal esophagus. And this has an important role uh, because it's where we have these esophageal viruses which emerge in patients with uh, portal hypertension, as demonstrated. The lymphatic system of the esophagus is also segmental. The upper esophagus drains to the deep cervical nodes, the mid esophagus, the mediastinal nodes, and the distal esophagus to the celiac and the gastric nodes. However, this lymphatic system uh, also in interconnected with numerous uh, channels, and this accounts for the spread of most esophageal cancers beyond the region at the time of discovery. So regarding the innervation, it's both parasympathetic and sympathetic supply to the esophagus. The parasympathetic regulates peristalsis through the vagus nerve, and you have cell bodies of the vagus nerve originating in the medulla. And you have the cell bodies which are located in the nucleus abigus to control the skeletal muscles. The ones located in the dorsal motor nucleus control the smooth muscle. The medullary vagal post ganglionic efferent nerves terminate directly onto the motor end plates of the skeletal muscle in the upper esophagus. And you have vagal preganglionic efferent nerves. And these ones, you have the smooth muscles in the distal esophagus terminate onto the neurons within the myenteric plexus, which are located between the circular and the longitudinal muscle layers of the esophagus. The Meissner's plexus is located between the submucosa and, and is the site for these afferent impulses within the esophageal wall. And these are transmitted to the central nervous system through the vagal, vagal parasympathetic and the uh, thoracic sympathetic nerves. You have sensory signals which are transmitted by this vagal afferent pathways traveling through the nucleus tractus solitaris within the central nervous system. From there, the nerves pass to the nucleus ambiguous, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve, where these signals now influence the motor function. So regarding pain sensation, uh, pain sensation arising from the esophagus is typically triggered by stimulation of chemoreceptors in the mucosa or submucosa, or even in the mechanoreceptors in the musculature. You have this central perception then uh, occurring where these impulses are transmitted to the brain by sympathetic and vagal afferents. The sympathetic afferents travel through the dorsal root ganglia to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and the vagal afferents travel through the nodosa ganglia to the nucleus tractus solitaris in the medulla. Now the esophageal neuroanatomic pathways tend to overlap with those of the heart and the respiratory system. And this may explain the difficulty for, in patients when they present uh, with this uh, pain, uh, chest pain syndromes to discern which particular organ it is that the pain is originating from. So let's go to the stomach. Looking at the anatomy, we know the stomach is J-shaped and it's a dilatation of the alimentary canal. The volume is between 1.5 to 2 liters in adulthood and the four regions which are denoted anatomically and histologically are shown. So we have the corpus, which is the largest portion of the stomach and it's located immediately below and continuous to the fundus. We have this incisura angularis, which is a fixed sharp indentation, two thirds the distance down the lesser curvature on the caudal aspect of the gastric body. We have the antrum, which extends from its indistinct border with the body to the junction of the pylorus with the, du the duodenum. And we have the pylorus, which is a tubular structure and contains the palpable circular muscles, uh, which we refer to as the pyloric sphincter and it's mobile owing to its enclosure between the peritoneum of the greater and the lesser omentum, but is generally located about two centimeters to the right of the midline at the level of the L1. 
So going through the arterial supply of the stomach, you have branches of the celiac artery, the common hepatic, left gastric, and the splenic arteries. You have formation of two arterial arcades, which are situated along the lesser curvature and the lower two, two thirds of the greater curvature. So at the lesser curvature, from above, you have the left gastric artery, and from below, you have the right gastric artery. The right gastric artery is a branch from the common hepatic artery, or the gastroduodenal artery, which is a branch from the common hepatic artery. So the greater curvature below the fundus is supplied from above by the left gastroepiploic artery, which is a branch of the splenic artery, and from below the right gastroepiploic artery, which is a branch of the gastroduodenal artery. The right and the left gastroepiploic artery is usually terminated by anastomosis, Therefore, completing this greater curvature arterial arcade. And occasionally, they end uh, without anastomosis. The arterial supply to the gastric fundus in the left, sorry, <clears throat> left upper aspect of the greater curvature is via the short gastric arteries, which arise from the splenic artery. So looking at the venous drainage, it's generally, uh, the venous drainage generally accompanies the arterial supply when it empties into the portal vein or into one of its tributaries. You can have the splenic or the superior mesenteric veins. So the left and the right gastric veins drain the lesser curvature of the stomach. The left gastric vein is also known as a coronary vein. The right and the left gastroepiploic veins drain the inferior aspect uh, and a portion of the greater curvature of the stomach. The right gastroepiploic vein and uh, several more distinct veins become the gastro colic veins that eventually terminate into the superior mesenteric vein, and there's no gastroduodenal vein. And the left gastroepiploic vein becomes a splenic vein, and the latter receives the short gastric veins and therefore drain the fundus and the upper greater curvature of the stomach. Um, looking at the lymphatics, the majority of the lymphatic drainage is into the celiac nodes. So the lymphatic, the lymphatic channels anastomose freely in the gastric wall with the lymphatic flow directed through one way of valves into one or four groups of nodes. So you have the inferior gastric region that drains into the subpyloric and omental nodes, then the hepatic nodes that terminate into the celiac nodes. Then you have the splenic or the superior aspect of the greater curvature lymph initially draining into the pancreatic spl splenic nodes, and then into the celiac nodes. Then you have the superior gastric or the lesser curvature region, lymph draining into the left and the right gastric nodes, which are adjacent to their respective vessels and terminates into the celiac nodes. And the hepatic or the pyloric portion of the lesser curvature, lymph drains into the suprapyloric nodes, then into the hepatic nodes, and fi finally, they find their way into the celiac nodes. So looking at the innervation, you have the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So in the sympathetic, you have the preganglionic fibers arising predominantly from the T6 to T8 spinal nerve roots, which synapse into the bilateral celiac ganglia with neurons whose postganglionic fibers course through the celiac plexus along the vascular supply of the stomach. Then the afferent pain transmitting fibers from the stomach and the motor fibers to the pyloric sphincter. Then the parasympathetic, you have innervation by the right and the left vagus nerves, which form the distal esophageal plexus and give rise to the posterior and anterior vagal trunks near the gastric cardia. The trunks contain preganglionic parasympathetic fibers as well as afferent fibers from the viscera. So both trunks give rise to the celiac and hepatic branches before continuing on with the lesser omentum slightly to the right of the lesser curvature as the anterior nerve of latter jet and the posterior nerve of latter jet. So these nerves give rise to multiple gastric branches to the stomach wall, where the preganglionic fibers synapse with the ganglionic cells in the submucosal, masonous, and myenteric uh, overbatch plexuses. And from these plexuses, the postganglionic fibers are distributed to cells and glands and to the smooth, smooth muscle. So looking at the gastric tissue layers, you have the mucosa, which is smooth, velvety, and blood-filled. Then the, uh, the cardia, antrum, and pylorus are 
more pill than the rest of the stomach, which is the fundus in the body. The fundus in the body, mucosa, uh, function as the secretory elements of the stomach. Uh, sorry, the fundus and the gas, the body mucosa, is where we normally have most of the functional secretory elements of the stomach located. And in the submucosa, you have this dense connective tissue, uh, skeleton of collagen and elastin fibers. You also find lymphocytes, plasma cells, arterioles, venules, the submucosal plexus and lymphatics contained here. Then you have the muscularis propria, where you have three muscle layers, the inner oblique, the middle circular, and the outer longitudinal. The inner oblique muscle fibers cause over the gastric fundus, and they cover the anterior and posterior aspects. The circular muscle fibers encircle the body of the stomach and thicken distally to become the pyloric sphincter. Then you have the longitudinal muscle fibers that cause primarily along the great and the lesser curvatures of the stomach. You also have the serosa, which is transparent and a continuation of the visceral peritoneum. Then uh, with regards to gastric acid production, you have this uh, redundant overlapping pathways where you have three phases, the cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. In the cephalic phase, which is uh, predominantly cholinergic and vagal, it's activated by the thought of food, the taste of food, even smell and the sight of food, and the act of swallowing. The gastric normally is triggered by chemical effects of food and gastric distension, where you have production of gastrin and histamine uh, stimulation. And the intestinal uh, phase is where food stimulates the hormone release. So basically, that's just a visual uh, description of what I've uh, described, the cephalic phase by the vagus and the parasympathetics uh, excite uh, pepsin and acid production. Then you have the gastric phase where you have this local nervous secretory uh, reflexes and the vagal reflexes and the role of gas, gastrin and histamine stimulation. So looking at the histology, we have the mucosal surface, which is formed of simple columnar epithelial cells. This is uh, about 20 to 40 micrometers in, uh, in height. It contains uh, basally located nuclei, uh, prominent Golgi stacks, and dense cytoplasm with especially apically located dense mucin-containing membrane-bound granules. These cells secrete mucus in the granules, and uh, this mucus is released via exocytosis and uh, apical expulsion. And uh, there's also cell exfoliation. And the primary role of mucus and bicarbonate is luminal cytoprotection. And you have a cellular renewal time for this particular surface of the mucous cells uh, in approximately three days. Then you have these uh, gastric pits, which are formed by invagination of the surface epithelial lining. This provides the gastric glands with access to access to the um, gastric lumen in a ratio of one pit is to 45 gastric glands. And the gastric glands are of different anatomic regions of the stomach and are lined with different types of specialized epithelial cells. In the cardia, you have small uh, small transition zone. Uh, from the esophageal squamous epithelium to the gastric columnar epithelium. And the glands have a branched and tortuous configuration and are populated by mucus, endocrine, and undifferentiated cells. Then you have this gradual transition from the cardiac glands to the second region. Then you have this acid-secreting segment of the stomach being located here, which encompasses the gastric fundus and the body and contains the parietal cells, where you have the auxentic uh, glands the parietal and the chief cells are also known as the peptic uh, cells, uh, which uh, have an endocrine function. Um, um, and also, um, I'll, I'll touch on the, I'll mention much later in subsequent slides, the auxentic glands. Then you have the uh, final region where you have the antrum and the pylorus, which contain the pyloric glands. And it's composed of endocrine cells, which include gastrin producing G cells and mucus cells. So the authentic glands are numerous and distinctive of the gastric glands, and they're responsible for the secretion of acid, intrinsic factor, and most gastric enzymes. They're fairly sim uh, simple tubular glands and straight, and are closely associated with uh, areas of gastric uh, fundus in the body. 
The gland is divided into three areas. We have the isthmus, where the surface uh, mucosal cells predominate. You have the neck, where the parietal and mucous cells predominate, and you have the base, where the chief cells predominate, along with the parietal and mucous neck cells. Then you have the endocrine cells, where you have some acustatin containing D cells and histamine secreting enterochromaffin like cells, among others, which are scattered throughout the Authentic epithelium. So the parietal cell is the principal cell of the auxentic gland, and it's responsible for the auxentic mucus uh, secretion of uh, three to the power ten uh, hydrogen ions per second at a final uh, hydrochloric uh, acid concentration of one hundred and fifty millimoles per liter. Then the parietal cells bulge into the lumen of the auxentic glands, and as the uh, Primary hydrogen secretors, they have altostructural characteristics that are different from other gastric cells. They are these large mitochondria. They have a microvilli lacking the glycocalyx and a cytoplasmic canaliculi system, which is in contact with the lumen. So it can occur in this uh, non secreting state or in the secreting state. So in the non secreting state, you have this cytoplasmic tubulo vesicular system predominating with a short microvilli that line the apical canaliculi. And in the secreting state, you have this tubular vesicular system that disappears, leaving an extensive system of intracellular canaliculi containing long microvilli. And the mitochondria occupy approximately 30 to 40% of the secreting parietal cell volume. And this provides energy that is required for acid secretion across the apical microvilli. So the proton pump hydrogen potassium ATP resides in the apical microvillous membrane and also uh, the carbonic anhydrase also resides here. The apical uh, hydrogen potassium ATP function as a proton translocator in the gastric uh, acid secretion. And the secretion begins uh, within five to 10 minutes of stimulation. And additionally, the parietal cells are the site for intrinsic factor uh, secretion. This is via membrane associated uh, vesic vesicle transport. So we have the mucous neck cells, which are closely associated with the parietal cells, and they appear, they appear singly close to the parietal cells, or it can also occur in groups of two to three in the auxentic gland neck or in the isthmus, isthmus of the auxentic gland. Then the mucous neck cells differ from uh, their surface counterparts in their synthesis of acidic sulfated mucus rather than the neutral mucus. And these mucous neck cells have uh, basal nuclei and large mucous granules around the nucleus rather than having these apically located granules. And the function of these two cell types uh, appears different. The surface mucous cells are cytoprotective, whereas the mucous neck uh, functions as a stem cell precursor for surface mucus cells, the parietal cells, the chief cells, and uh, the endocrine cells. Now the zymogen cells, also known as the chief cells, predominate in the deeper layers of the auxentic glands. And these pyramid-shaped cells play a role in the synthesis and secretion of pepsinogen 1 and 2. The cytoplasm of these uh, chief cells has uh, prominent basophilic staining. And this is owing to the abundance of ribosomes. And these ribosomes are either free in the cytoplasm or in association with extensive endoplasmic uh, reticulum. The zymogen granules lie in the apical cytoplasm and their contents are released into the gastric lumen following fusion of the limiting membrane and the granule with the luminal membrane. And once in the lumen, pepsinogens are converted into pepsin. We also have D cells which secrete somatostatin and we have enterochromaffin uh, cells, which are, uh, most of them contain serotonin. And uh, they are the only enteroendocrine cells which contain uh, histamine. So just in summary, you have the stomach where, uh, which secretes gastrin into the blood in response to a meal, then gastrin returns to the stomach and stimulates muscle contraction and acid production. Then this partially digested food, which is called uh, chyme, which moves into the small intestine and stimulates the secretion of cholecystokine and secretin into the blood. Then uh, cholecystokine and secretin stimulates the secretion of digestive enzymes and bicarbonate ions from the pancreas into the small intestine. Then also it stim CCK 
stimulates this contraction of the gallbladder, which then releases bile into the small intestine. I've just touched briefly, but on the on the last two steps, but this one will be covered in subsequent uh, presentations. So th thank you all for listening, and uh, I know this has been a mouthful, and uh, there's quite a lot I can imagine. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dominic. Um, I think it's a very, very difficult topic. And um, despite the fact that we cut it up to just the four gut, you can see already just how much knowledge there is to, to be had and to be understood. Um, and so, yeah, really, I thank you so much for doing that. Um, I mean, I think for the rest of us, if it was hard to listen to, or to take in. You can imagine how poor Dominic feels uh, in uh, trying to synthesize it and explain it to us so that we get something from it. So the way I see it is that nobody is expected to remember all of those facts. It's just basically impossible. But what we want to do is to lay down the foundation and then to use this information so that you can understand the basis of when things go wrong and to relate pathology to physiology that has gone wrong. And I think if you do that, then actually you can get a lot of excitement uh, from understanding the anatomy and physiology. So um, what I want to do is just A, to, to see that the gut works in concert with many other systems so that it works for its basic function, which is to extract nutrients from the food that we eat. And the digestion starts with obviously eating the food, then mechanical, then chemical digestion, then it has to be absorbed, and then it has to be uh, distributed to all the organs in the body, including the gut. Um, and then whatever is left that is not utilized or useful, which is undigested fiber, etc., is eliminated as waste. This is all important. And for me, the excitement is that if you think about it, the gastrointestinal tract is a long tube which actually exists outside the body. And what I mean for that is that for it to be incorporated in the interstitium of the body, the food and the waste is outside of the body because it comes in at the top and it goes out at the body, out the body. But what is extracted, which are nutrients and fluid and so forth, that is taken in into the gastrointestinal interstitium. And so it's basically like a tube that runs through the body that is effectively outside the body. It happens to be the only system that is connected to the external environment. And because of that, it is adapted so it can sense antigens, whether they come in the form of food or bacteria or whatever it is, um, that it can sense what is self and sense what is not self, mount a response, an immune response um, that is effective to get rid of what the body doesn't need and what is considered foreign and to keep what is required. Hence, you've got such a dense mucosal associated lymphoid tissue in the lamina propria, apart from the mucus and the epithelium, which also work to keep out what is foreign, which is outside the body, which is connected uh, to the external environment. So every structure is made for purpose, whether it's the epithelium or the muscularis layer uh, or the um, the orbuck plexus and the mysnus plexus, all of them are there for a purpose, working in concert with the endocrine system, with a cardiovascular system to give uh, the blood supply that you need for the gut to function. Uh, and don't forget that the, uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system is the parasympathetic, the uh, sympathetic, as well as the enteric nervous system, the three of them they constitute the autonomic uh, nervous system, not just the parasympathetic uh, and the sympathetic. Dominic, why do you think it is that the, the gastrointestinal tract is longer when we die than when we are alive? Um, uh, this one, I'll just have to make an intelligent, uh, intelligent guess. I would imagine yeah. that as, uh, the more we age, the more would need to to have more 
like more surface area to absorb more nutrients to meet up with the metabolic requirements of growth. So like the size of the of the of the, of the gut at childhood and adulthood would be totally different. So I would imagine it would. I don't know. That, that's how. Yes. Uh, Does anybody? Can. That's not entirely true. Um, does anybody else have any other suggestion maybe to offer? Why it's longer post-mortem? Anybody, don't be shy. I can try. Dr. Van Escape, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon. Thanks, Prof. Dominic. Um, is it related to, Dominic pointed out in the submucosa, the, uh, the muscles that we have, the longitudinal and the and the circular muscles, they're generally in a contracted state. Um, and in the contracted state, they cause kind of make bring in the sort of how it controls how it controls it controls peristalsis and the movement of fluid, such that in the post mortem those muscles would be wouldn't be in a contracted state. And hence possibly the I don't know, I'm guessing the hundred percent. So when we're alive, they are in a tonic state. And then when we lose that, when we die, actually the, the gut actually lengthens. So that's, that's entirely true. Um, and then another question that I just want you to think about, just to try and make it more interesting is, um, why do we need propulsion uh, and peristalsis? It's a long tube that's straight, well, except for the accessory organs and obviously some curvatures like the stomach and so forth. So, why do you need um, those activities to propel food along? I mean, the simple answer is that not even gravity is sufficient to actually propel food bolus along. You need, you need the function of the, um, the proper muscular layer, the circular and the um, longitudinal to move food along. And don't forget that in the esophagus, you have peristalsis. But in the small bowel, you have peristalsis, but you also have segmentation. Because the issue is not just to move food along. You also have to allow for mixing of food with the digestive juices and the acid and so forth, so that you can obviously break it down to micro micro molecules that can be absorbed. That's the aim of the gut to take every bit of whatever you eat, calorie-wise, break it down to the smallest, smallest molecule so that it can be absorbed. And in order for you to do that, they need to be mixing. So there needs to be segmentation and mixing. So segmentation, it differs from peristalsis in that you have forward and back movement. That's with the segmentation. Whereas with peristalsis, it simply means contraction to move food down. But in the small bowel, you need segmentation, which goes backwards and forward so that food is mixed so that it can be broken down. So you have mechanical digestion, you have chemical digestion, all of which are important uh, so that the food, uh, um, you can get the value out of the, the food that you're eating and the nutrients. I mean, another thing which I find interesting is that if you think about uh, venous uh, drainage from the, from the abdomen, when it is from the gut, it necessarily goes through the portal veins, splenic veins to the liver because it is the liver that can extract those nutrients for storage and for that and that before it goes to the heart. That doesn't happen with any other system. So this is the point I'm trying to make about the gut. Every function, every structure is made for purpose to provide nutrients for the body. The stomach also is a grinder, hence you have that additional oblique muscle layer, which you don't find anywhere else. You need the serosa to attach the organs in the abdomen to the peritoneum, which also between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum, there's blood vessels as well with the mesenteric vessels. All of that is important to anchor it, to provide a, a, a vascular supply, which you don't get elsewhere. In the esophagus, you have an adventitia, which is also um, sort of connective tissue, but it's a bit loose, but it also uh, anchors it uh, to, to the structures around it. Otherwise, as the esophagus contracting peristalsis, it has no anchorage, it has, it has no traction. So you couldn't possibly get the food down. Um, you've, you showed a slide with the different um, mucosal surfaces, again, adapted for function. In the esophagus, it's stratified because of the food that we eat, it may be uh, damaging or abrasive to the lining. So it needs to be a little bit tougher 
in the small bowel, it's columnar epithelium, single line, because you need for the stuff to be absorbed. In the rectum, uh, it's a bit thicker because, again, it's more closer to the external environment. Uh, and so you need that added layer of protection. So I think I'm just trying to show how nothing has happened by accident. The gut is adapted to extract every calorie that is taken in uh, for use um, and broken down and bathed in enzymes and, 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 and uh, secretions, mucus to protect uh, the lining, to make things smoother. The stomach would auto digest if it were not for that thick layer of mucus, which not only protects the stomach from auto digestion, protects us, it filters all the bugs, which is why when you treat it um, uh, with the uh, acids, you actually allow for things like C. diff uh, to, to set in. So I think if you can find interest and relevance in the conditions that you will see, understanding the underlying sort of basic physiology and pathology, you don't have to remember every single thing, it's impossible. Um, then I think you can find meaning uh, in, in, in managing your patients. And I think you'll be able to offer more value to your patients as a gastroenterologist compared to a general physician who obviously won't go to this level of detail. The issue of the saliva is important because when you have xerostomia, you can't eat, you can't swallow, people lose weight, they get ulcers, they get infections, they get bleeding. So every bit of it is important. There's nothing which uh, uh, is irrelevant. Um, I wanted to also say, if you think about the rugae in the stomach, that allows that you can actually increase the amount of food taken in by 50 fold. Um, you know, if you wanted to eat that much, but everything is adapted and everything is adaptable. So there, there's a there's a reason for 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 everything. Um, and don't forget the connection between, as you said, uh, Dominic, between the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system. And don't forget that one of the um, neurotransmitters released um, by the gut, the enteric nervous system, is serotonin, and that's why that is related to how we feel. Uh, our emotions and, and so forth. So all of these things are, are interconnected. And there are also some paradoxes. So for instance, you said that the um, secretion of the uh, salivary glands is under parasympathetic control. But it's also true that when you are very, very anxious or very, very nervous and you are in a flight fright situation, actually you, in, you also release a lot of uh, uh, saliva because your mouth is dry and, 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 and so forth. So there are some paradoxical um, uh, reactions. For instance, the parasympathetic system is, we talk about rest and digest, but it does inhibit the lower esophageal uh, sphincter because obviously you need it closed so that the stomach can start to do its mechanical work. So there are some nuances here and there, but overall we think of it as the parasympathetic is the one that causes the, the gut to, to digest, to absorb, increase blood flow, whereas the sympathetic system, you get shut down of the secretions from the glands, shut down of the muscle contraction uh, and vasoconstriction. Are there any questions uh, from anybody? As I say, it is a tough topic but we've tried to cut it uh, into bits so that it's not too overwhelming. Um, and I think the stuff you simply have to read, uh, there are a lot of YouTube uh, videos, which uh, if you're an auditory learner, they are quite nice. I'm an auditory learner, um, but if you're a visual learner, there's also a lot of material out there. Any questions or comments? Uh, None, VG, I saw that you're on, um, thank you. Do you have anything that you want to add or some nuance that can be clarified for the fellows uh, or, or something that wasn't clear from Dominic's uh, presentation? No, I, no, I think I'm uh, just going to echo uh, almost everything you said, uh, Sheiko. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year to everyone, just by the way. Happy New Year. Uh, Thank you, <laughs> Vijay. <laughs> Uh, no, I just want to echo. I think it. I think it's a vast amount, and it depends how far you actually want to go into this. Yeah. I think from uh, for the fellows from an exam point of view, especially with the uh, short answer type uh, questions, there actually isn't anything stopping us from including physiology 
in that question. So, for example, if we asked uh, if we asked something about related to like you know iron, iron oh. deficiency, included as a uh, in that question. Although I think almost everyone will think will say things like I'll do an upper scope, I'll do a you know, a you low scope, and then I'll do a video like uh, capsule to look for this occult. Uh, 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 iron deficiency, but then don't forget about iron absorption. So then we might even just ask a specific physiology related question under that uh, question of iron absorption, uh, under that question of iron deficiency, uh, asking you to actually describe how iron shifts from the intestine, how it's absorbed, how it's ingested, and how it goes from the small bowel all the way into the hemoglobin. Uh, globe. And so there isn't anything stopping us from asking those kinds of questions. So I think as you go through the different sections, uh, you'll find that there's certain areas where the physiology, for example, is more relevant than others. And these are the things that we see frequently in everyday uh, uh, like in practice. So yeah. iron deficiency, vitamin B, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, how is vitamin B12 absorbed? And that's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. physiology over there. Yeah. And uh, I think I put something up there. I just gave a very obvious example. I mean, we all prescribe proton pumps in every day. And we say to people, take it half an hour to an hour before breakfast, etc. But then that also means you need to have an understanding of how that physiology works with the hydrogen potassium pumps. Why are we saying, you know, take it half an hour to an hour before? Um, so yeah, so I think uh, as you go along, you will see achalasia. I mean, you know, there, there again, exactly. where you have, where you, as you're reading achalasia, say, oh, I need to understand a bit of this physiology. So I think for those kinds of things that are quite irrelevant that we see every day, um, there isn't anything stopping us from asking physiology. And I think provided you have some reasonable understanding that it makes uh, sense. You don't have to go into great uh, in-depth stuff, uh, detail. I'm sure you'll, you'll be provided with uh, a very uh, high uh, sort of mark for that uh, section. Yeah, um, I think that's about all I I actually wanted to say, Masheko. Thanks. Thanks, Viji. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I absolutely couldn't agree more. None, is there anything to add? Oh, hi. As an HOD, everybody. Hi, Noni. Yeah, and everybody else. Good, good afternoon and good evening. Everything that you guys are saying sounds to to me to be very important, and relevant. I think I'm not sure if this is for the exams. I'm, I'm what I'm going to say is not for the exams, but it's, it's just to appreciate everything so that you. Truly become a, I mean, a complete guy, a complete person when it comes to gastroenterology and other disciplines, especially endocrinology. You see, so I think that I'm just saying the gut, those gut hormones. One would, it's nicer if you understand them, like on top of those gastrin and what they do. Yes, but the ones that control appetite and satiety, things like grand ghrelin and somatostatins, there in the Leptin. other lobes go mm. down to GLP-1 so they can understand the agonists and antagonists and how they control appetite as well and why if you give somebody GLP-1 agonists, they tend to vomit more again, you know? These are just the gut hormones which are relevant now lately when you're dealing with your weight control things as to what uh, are these guys trying to modulate, basically. That is just on top of everything that you're seeing. I'm saying it's not necessarily for exams, but when I'm talking about these guys, we're talking about loss of weight, what hormones are they really dealing with? Which are they in the gut, basically? We know them, ghrelin, leptins, and everything, basically. And your control of blood sugar, as you say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's interesting, really. But what I've, what I've learned from the first time from you is that the digestive system inside is still outside the body. It's, it's something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right. It's a fascinating concept. Um, Thank no, you. thanks. Thanks, Nane. I mean, I, I think you are right. And I think for me, I really feel very strongly that with a, with a subspeciality like ours, where you really can get by with yeah. very little knowledge because it is procedure heavy and we see the same things, especially in tertiary centers, right? But I've also noted that in, in private, you have patients who actually come with 
very different things uh, and pathology than what you see here in the state. And so you might have a patient who comes with recurrent hiccups. And, you know, it's not kidney disease, it's not, it's not an MI, it's not all the usual suspects, you know. And if you don't understand basic anatomy, you may never figure it out. Uh, and, and I find those patients really very challenging. You know, people come with perianal pain, you know. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, refer to the colorectal surgeon. You have to figure it out. And you examine the patient and you can't find any local or obvious cause. But then maybe it has to do with the, 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 the neurology. Or, or, or something else. And, and I think if you don't have that basic understanding, you really find yourself uh, in a difficult situation. Uh, so I, I just feel that if you can, please don't take shortcuts. Try to, try, try to understand what's going on. And then, as I say, you'll be of far more value uh, to your patient as a subspecialist than, mm -hmm. say, just a, a specialist uh, or, or any other doctor. I think our patients deserve that. So we could go on and on and on and on. Um, oh. When it comes to the specific topics, uh, maybe, maybe spend a, a slide or two just reviewing the relevant uh, anatomy and physiology, say, to echinacea when, when, when that comes. Uh, just also as a, to reinforce what we've heard today and just to remind yourself of the importance of just having this background uh, knowledge. But as I say, it's impossible to expect you to remember all of that. I don't remember all of that. But I think... This was also just to showcase what you need to know, whether you remember it all or not. That's a separate story because you can't know what you don't know. So I think part of it was to say this is what is needed uh, to be understood. And then I think just work uh, slowly and gradually at trying to get as much understanding of it uh, as possible. So I think the first session was always going to run over time. I'm sorry about that. Um, I've given... Um, uh, I've assigned topics, I think, for, for three people. And then I'll try and do for the rest of the quarter so that people have advanced notice. Um, so thank you, Dominic. I really appreciate that you took one for the team without that much notice. And thank you for doing a fantastic job of what is really a very, very difficult uh, presentation. Um, but I think you captured all the things that, that we really need to know. And then as I say, when we do small bowel, we'll then do just the small bowel and attend in physiology and we'll do the same for the large bowel. Um, I'm going to, to stop there. Um, in two weeks' time, I can't remember what the topic is. Please just look out for your emails uh, on Echo. And uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to a new cycle, a new year. And uh, we hope uh, you guys will derive from your training what you hope to derive. Um, thank you and, and good night. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate the support always. Good night. Night, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.